Welcome to the Italian Renaissance Podcast, where we discuss the culture and art of 15th and 16th century Italy. I'm your host, Lawrence Trinangeli. Andiamo avanti. Renaissance people, welcome back to the Italian Renaissance Podcast. I am so delighted today to introduce to you Michael Cortati, who is a practicing lawyer and writer in his spare time. He's recently released a new English translation of Matteo Bandello's Romeo and Juliet, which is what we're here to talk about today. That is the source story for the play that we all know and love uh, after Shakespeare. Michael is an Italian-Australian. In recent years, he's published many articles about Italian history, culture, and literature on his author's website. He's also translated Il Drago, a short story by the 19th century Sicilian writer Luigi Capuana. Folks, Michael Cortari. Lawrence, thank you so much for um, uh, arranging this interview with me. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here on your podcast. I've listened to quite a few of your episodes and really love them, especially the literature ones, which is where I'm I'm focused. You did a great series on Dante, really captured his um, journey through uh, the three the three worlds. So it's it's lovely to be here. Thank you. So happy to have you, especially because Matteo Bandello is is not an author that in really in all of my training that I've come across before we corresponded. If we can start with the basics about Matteo Bandello, can you give us a brief overview of who he is, the circumstances of his work, and the cultural context of Renaissance Italy that he's writing in? Sure, sure. I'll start a little bit focusing, you know, on him and then expand out a little bit and talk about his context. So he was born about 1485 in Piemont to a wealthy family. Uh, he spent much of his early adulthood in uh, Lombardy, particularly living near Verona and Mantua. He was a monk in his day job and eventually became a bishop, but that wasn't his calling. His lifelong passion was writing and he devoted much of his time to to that. He was born in the, you know, what what we might think of as the High Renaissance period. He was born in the same year, I think, as Lorenzo il Magnifico died. And um, uh, the world was changing. Um, as he grew older, Italy became the scene of uh, great power conflict between France and Spain. And um, this impacted him directly. Uh, his own family home was looted and he spent uh, the, the, end, the end years of his life in exile. He traveled around Italy for a while, but finally landed in France, where he secured a, a position as Bishop of Argent. But um, as earlier in his life, he was really there to do his writing. And it was that it was in that final period of his life that he completed his writings. He's really known uh, mostly as a novelliere. So um, essentially, that uh, means uh, an Italian writer of short stories or, or novellas. He also wrote sonnets, which he dedicated to one of his patrons, Lucretia Gonzaga. But he is best known for his collection of more than 200 novellas. Uh, as you've mentioned, he isn't very known, which is um, uh, difficult to understand because he's, in fact, one of the most influential Italian novellieri of the Renaissance, um, particularly outside Italy. At least four of his novellas were reflected directly or directly, indirectly, in Shakespeare plays. Romeo and Juliet, of course, which we're talking about today, but also some of his others, um, Much Ado About Nothing, Twelfth Night, and Cymbeline, also owe uh, plots to Bandello, or we find those plots also in Bandello. So that's that's already saying something, but he also influenced other writers, writers like Stendhal, Byron, and Lope de la Vega. And um, so, you know, people talk about him being one of the most influential, if not the most influential Italian novelliero of the Renaissance. And sadly, that influence has been missed a little, and uh, I've wondered about the reasons for that. Uh, one reason may be that we no longer really... Re, you know, the, the novella for literature form no longer resonates with us. We don't read novellas very much. But I think also largely because he was, in a sense, a transitional writer. He, he sits at the margins of Italian national literature, and even more so, of course, in English and French literature, where 
uh, which were some of these areas of influence. You know, in Italy, for example, if we think about uh, Francesco de Sanctis, his, his classic volume on the history of Italian literature, he barely gets a sentence. Uh, and he deserves much more uh, because of his influence outside Italy. So, yeah, that's a little bit uh, just to introduce Bandello. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Just uh, No, that was fantastic. Um, I, you know, the way you're, you're speaking about him really makes me think of what I have unsuccessfully pushed against in this podcast, but I do in my own work, and that is the Rome, Florence, Venice uh, triumvirate that sort of leaves out other major centers of cultural production in Italy, including, we're saying, Lombardy and, and Piedmont. Yep, absolutely. You know, Italy wasn't one country then. It was numerous countries, and they, they were all playing their role. Um, you know, to mention another s center just near uh, Venice, Ferrara was a great center of theater, which was very influential. Yes, and you said he wrote for the Gonzaga court, which, which is out of yeah. uh, Ma Mantua is Gonzaga. I believe so. That's right. Yeah. So for our listeners who are not very familiar with early modern literature and folks, I use the term early modern just to generalize. You know, it, the Renaissance is a, is, a, is a modern term that we put back in history. Early modern sort of encompasses it without uh, such strict, uh, what would we say, boundaries. So so for listeners not familiar with early modern literature, I'm understanding that Bandello's intervention as an intermediary between what would be an oral tradition and an earlier written tradition, like Boccaccio, I'm thinking, and transitions into what becomes Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Can you tell us about how Bandello's Romeo and Juliet fits into the overarching concept of this tradition? Sure, that's a really interesting question and something I've thought about, you know, this transition from oral storytelling to... Um, written stories and um, because of course you know the oral tradition comes first um, by its very nature we we don't have a you know as much evidence as we might like about what stories people were telling to each each other but we find a lot of evidence of it in um, you know as it sets down in, in writing uh, Bandello was a proud imitator of the tradition which was established in, in, in Italy really by Boccaccio. No doubt there were others, but his Decameron is the one we remember the most. Uh, although De Boccaccio was writing 200 years further from our time. So you, your l listeners may already be familiar with the form of this writing, but just to summarise, so the author sets up a frame story for example, if we think of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, he has a group of pilgrims uh, on a journey and they tell stories to each other uh, as they're going along their journey. And each short story is told by a character in the frame na narrative. This is a very ancient form. We find it in uh, Homer's Iliad, for example, and notably also in the Thousand and One Nights. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a form of writing that had been in the um, Mediterranean for a long time. Bandello uh, uses a similar structure. As I said, you know, he's a proud, he's a proud imitator of Boccaccio, but he also has his own innovations in how he's going to approach it. So he doesn't really have a single frame story, but he uses a kind of fictionalized autobiography to provide the frame. So basically what he does is he pretends he heard each story told by someone orally to him at some palace of this or that noble or this or that countess. Um, we know that probably this is a fiction, and it's certainly a fiction in the case of Romeo and Juliet, because if you compare his version with, with previous Italian written versions, there's two other versions, I'll talk about them in a little, you can see where he's copied and where he's expanded and improved on the story. Despite that, um, you know, in, certainly in, in the case of Romeo and Juliet, I, I think there's something in the oral storytelling tradition that he and other writers put in their frame tales that tell us something about, you know, how people were telling stories to each other. Basically, the frame narratives were very believable because it's, it's exactly, I imagine, the kind of thing they might have experienced, you know, an afternoon or evening in company where um, people told each other stories. 
Um, and in fact, novellas uh, seem to be designed really to fit into one night's storytelling. Um, we might perhaps think of them as, uh, you know, an episode of a show that we might watch, um, you know, now. So unfortunately, the novella kind of disappeared with the rise of the novel, although, you know, it contributed to, you know, what uh, the novel emerging in the form we have it today. So looking backwards from Bandello, he wasn't the first to write a Romeo and Juliet story. There were two versions before him, one by a guy called Luigi da Porto, who uh, was a native of Vicenza, Vicenza, not right next to Verona. And then before him, there was a guy called Masuccio Salernitano. So the Luigi da Porto, he gave us the names, Romeo and Juliet, and he puts the story in Verona. But he, in two, two he also copied it from um, Masuccio Salernitano. And um, in Masuccio Salernitano's version, they have different names. They're Mariotto and Genozza or Ganozza. And uh, the, they live in Siena. And r- the Romeo character flees to Alexandria, Egypt. So it's a, a much more Mediterranean-oriented story. So this is kind of an interesting evolution in itself. Um, and what makes the Bandello version unique uh, as compared to these previous versions? And, of course, each writer is improving on the story. Uh, but he his version is the one that makes it out of Italy um, and is picked up in France and then in England. Um, now, having talked about copying, I think it's important to contextualize it and what, you know, how writers worked in the Renaissance because, you know, we tend to think of that as plagiarism. Uh, but of course, that idea wasn't around in the Renaissance. There was no copyright. Um, and in fact, it was standard practice for writers to take existing stories and seek to make them better. That's what Pandello did, Boccaccio did, Chaucer did. Uh, it's also what Shakespeare did. He, takes stories and adapts them to stage. Um, in fact, some of Boccaccio's stories originally come from India, and no one thought there was anything wrong with this. In fact, um, you know, being original wasn't important, but being able to take a great story and make it better, that's what made you a wonderful writer in that era. Oh, so B- Bandello um, coming to France, I think really Im- important is a, c- a context that you set up was this sort of turbulent relationship with France and Spain at mm. the end of the 15th century. But there's an expression that, when, when I was studying French Renaissance, there's an expression that they say that even though France was conquering so much of Italy, it was really Italy that conquered France. That is, the culture of the Italian Renaissance was being adopted by um, their exposure to what was happening across the Alps. So is this that sort of relationship, the going to France like post-conquest. I'm not entirely sure like the trajectory of his movement as it relates to these themes. Yeah, I I think that's exactly right. He, um, uh, you know, I think he and his family or his uh, patrons were on the French side. So he ends up taking refuge there. But he's really there in that period when uh, the cultural movement that was happening in Italy was being picked up in France and, uh, yeah, so that's absolutely right. It's during the period when Catherine de' Medici still has a strong influence, you know, as uh, the French queen. So, yeah, absolutely. And and I think, you know, I'm Italian background and I imagine you also yourself. Of course, you know, it's just historical, you know, geographical accident that it happens to be Italy. Uh, but it's very, you know, it's a very important geographical accident because, of course, those movements that were happening – in, in, in powerful ways shape modernity. Uh, conversations about gender, for example, were really flourishing in this Renaissance environment. And we inherited those conversations also, you know, about cross dressing, all, all sorts of things that we take for granted now. Um, you know, we can trace to this period. So I want to, you know, I, I want to ask you about your translation. So your translation of Vandela's Romeo and Juliet into English, it's really giving the English speaking public new access to understanding the influence that Bandello had on Shakespeare. So as an extreme fan of J.R.R. Tolkien, that is the author of The Lord of the Rings, I loved reading on your on your author's site when you said, and I'm quoting you here, it's like loving Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, but not even knowing that J.R.R. Tolkien existed. Uh, today we would recognize Bandello as a co-author, end quote. 
I'm very interested to hear how Bandello's work came to England and how we are able to confidently relate it to Shakespeare. And that, I mean, by some uh, narrative examples that our listeners who are probably very familiar with Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet might be able to, to bridge. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Renaissance people. If you are enjoying the Italian Renaissance podcast, I have good news. We're now active on Patreon. You can show your love for the show by becoming a patron and get access to additional resources, information, and artworks. Better yet, those who join the Renaissance Master or Renaissance Patron tier will get access to at least one additional podcast episode each month. My goal is to ensure that the main podcast remains a free, accessible source for everyone. Become a patron today through the link in the show notes to support the continued production of new episodes and help build and maintain this community. The Italian Renaissance Shop is now also active on Etsy, linked in the show notes. Sport our logo or choose from a growing selection of Italian art-inspired designs. Discounts are offered to select Patreon tiers as well. Your support has my immortal gratitude. Now, enjoy the show. Sure, sure. Um, and I love that you picked up that I'm a lifelong Tolkien. I love that you picked up on that. Um, I'm a lifelong Tolkien nerd myself and, you know, the parallel absolutely fits. It, it isn't true for all of Bandello's no novellas that show up in Shakespeare, but it's really surprising how much of the Bandello version of Romeo and Juliet we experience in the Shakespeare play. The plot, the characters... Uh, many of their sentiments are virtually the same. Uh, only a few details change, um, although Shakespeare also creates um, uh, only a few details in the plot, although Shakespeare also creates a lot of new, beautiful language in the process of uh, adapting uh, the prose uh, of the novella to a dramatic form, including adding poetry, um, which isn't really present in Bandella. So... How does Romeo and Juliet get to England? Um, so I mentioned Bandello was in exile, and we've been talking a little bit about that, uh, and that he worked on his novellas in the final years of his life. And pretty soon after he published them in Italian, there was uh, a French translation. Um, and in fact, I think you know the fact of his exile is perhaps a significant fact that we should emphasise. You know, he's a refugee in France and his presence there makes this cultural, is part of this cultural diffusion. So it's, it's interesting to observe that. Um, so it went into French translation first by in, in, into a version by Pierre and I won't get the pronunciation right, Boastuar. And then it was expanded on by Francois de Belforest. The story reaches England very quickly, and it was probably available in Italian and certainly in French in England by the 1560s. So the first English translation that we know of is dates to 1562, which is only eight years after it was published in Italian. Uh, it was a poetic version by a person called Arthur Brooke, and the title page claims that it's a translation from Bandel's Italian, although, in fact, Brooke was working from the French version. But in any case, Brooke emphasising Bandel or Bandello tells us that, you know, that was a selling point. Another interesting point about Brooke's translation is that, in fact, in his introduction, he mentions that he saw the play performed which is a bit strange. It's 1562. It's quite early. But he saw a play of Romeo and Juliet performed at uh, presumably at Inns of Court where he was studying law. And in fact, in the 1560s to 80s, if you search on early English books online, you already find numerous references to Romeo and Juliet. You know, they're mentioned with other uh, famous lovers like Tristan and Isolde, for example, in English literature. So that that's interesting. So, but it's a... You know, a little bit later that we see Shakespeare's play. So the first unequivocal evidence for Shakespeare's play is the first quarter of the Romeo and Juliet play, which dates to 1597, although, of course, the play has to be a little bit older. And from Shakespeare's text, and, you know, uh, numerous uh, researchers or scholars have done textual studies, uh, it's known that he worked primarily from the Brook uh, poem, poetic version. 
Um, although it's interesting that um, he seems, um, Shakespeare seems to be well aware where Brooke has, um, you know, kind of uh, added unfortunate elements in his translation. He wasn't as um, as faithful as translators tend to be today and seems to weed a lot of that out, um, which suggests that perhaps he also is consulting the French and perhaps the Italian versions. And, and you said unfortunate elements. Do you mean narrative elements or elements of language? Yeah, narrative elements. He, he kind of, um, it's um, pretty widely held that the Brook translation wasn't great in, uh, you know, as a piece of literature in its own right. Um, you know, his attempts at versification just didn't work that well. And uh, he adds quite a bit of moralizing, which is not part of the Bandello story. Um, so, and a lot, you know, a lot of that is stripped away and, and you get, you know, you get a much kind of cleaner version uh, in Shakespeare's uh, dramatic play. I might also mention the broader context, you know, so, you know, was it this, was it just Bandello being picked up? And of course not. You've already mentioned uh, the spread of the, the Rena Renaissance uh, from Italy into France and the broader context in England, the same sort of thing is happening. England is very much looking in this era to Italian literary models. Literally hundreds of Italian works are appearing in English versions and English adaptations. And um, if we look to sh just to Shakespeare uh, and, you know, disregard his history, his English history plays, more than half of his plays are set in Italy. And if we consider the other influences that have come from Italy, you know, the, the uh, connection becomes even, even stronger. Sonnet, you know, his sonnets, they, they come from Petrarch, uh, you know, or, you know, uh, a new version based initially on the Petrarchan sonnet. Uh, his use of comedy comes from Commedia dell'arte. The five act structure is something that Cynthia talked about that probably has older, um, models as well. Plots from Italian literature, which show up in, in, a uh, variety of Shakespeare plays. So we can see how deep the influence is and how formative it is to now, to what we now call the, uh, calling English literature. You know, they've, um, Shakespeare takes these elements from beyond the shores of England and is part of that movement in England, which is creating something new and wonderful. And, you know, the advancements that we see in English drama. It's also interesting to mention John Florio, who was an Anglo-Italian uh, living in Shakespearean England. Um, he uh, was responsible for writing the first substantial Italian English dictionary. And it turns out he's the third most prolific contributors, contributor of words to the English language, which, and again, you know, John Florio is a character that we don't really remember, but, you know, behind Shakespeare and Chaucer, he's given us the most words of any individual. So that that's kind of another sort of indicator of uh, this, you know, cultural communication that was going on in that period. So so let's think about the these sort of common narrative elements that when listeners say, I have to read his translation of Bandello, what are they going to find that is going to make them remember sitting in their ninth grade class, reading Romeo and Juliet okay. for the first time, the things that made them drawn to that story. What what are some some um, of those elements that, that were carried over that they'll find in Bandello's work? Sure. Well, perhaps the best way to do that might be to share a passage from Bandello in, in translation. And uh, the passage I have in mind is um, a passage where uh, Juliet's in her bed, and in the Shakespeare version, she's alone. Uh, in the Bandello version, we're hearing her thoughts, uh, but in Shakespeare, it's a soliloquy. Um, and if you reread that part of the Shakespeare play, you'll see a lot of parallels uh, with this uh, particular passage from uh, Bandello. So let me just uh, bring it up. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten to prepare that earlier, so it'll just take me a moment to do... Take your time. So just bear I'll... with me. And while you're looking for that, I do just want to want to say I don't know um, how how the um, Australian school system teaches Shakespeare, 
But at least the way that, that I learned was you were always assigned a character and you spent your literature time performing from your seat. And of, of course, I was um, without any consent. I had to do Friar Lawrence. That was the one because that was my name. So, so I played all of Friar Lawrence in my high school desk drama of Romeo and Juliet. Oh, that's that's wonderful. We we don't really have that tradition here in uh, uh, Australia. Um, uh, we, we just tended to read and discuss. But I think what you do there sounds a lot like a lot more fun and um, a much better way to um, to get a sense of um, uh, the play. Okay. So um, the this, this section I'm reading on from starts with Juliet being prepared for her marriage. So uh, I'll just try to read it and hopefully, some, you know, it's in translation, but I hope some of uh, Bandello's style and the beauty of his language comes through. The day on which the nuptials were to take place was fixed and Juliet was sumptuously arrayed in a splendid dress and precious gems. She showed herself willing and laughed and jested Yet each hour until the time fixed to drink the potion seemed to her a thousand years. The night came before the Sunday on which she was to be publicly wed. She, as young as she was, without a word to any, prepared a glass of water, and making sure that her nurse did not see her, put it by her bed. Little if any sleep did she get that night. Warring thoughts tormented her soul. As the hour of the dawn approached, when she should drink the potion, Tybalt appeared to her in imagination, as she had seen him, with the blood dripping wound cut deep in his throat. Recalling that she would be laid beside, if not upon him, and that within that tomb there were other corpses and many naked bones, she felt a chill within her body, and the hairs of her body stood on end. Fear so oppressed her that she trembled as a leaf in the wind. An icy sweat spread over all her limbs, and it seemed to her that those corpses were little by little tearing her body in a thousand pieces. For a time, fear so gripped her that she did not know what she would do. Then having somewhat recovered her courage, she said to herself, Oh my, what am I doing? Where will I allow myself to be taken? If by chance I wake before the friar and Romeo come, what shall become of me? Would I be able to suffer the foulness that issues from Tybalt's rotting corpse, when in my home I can hardly bear any stench, no matter how slight it be. Who knows if not some serpent or a thousand worms are found in that sepulchre, which I fear so greatly and which so much disgust me. And as my heart does not have the courage to look on them, how can I bear to have them all around and touching me? Have I not also heard it many times said that many fearful things have befallen of a night, not just in tombs, but in churches and cemeteries too? With these fearful thoughts, and imagining a thousand abominable things. She had almost resolved not to take the powder and came near to pouring it on the ground. And so she was lost in strange, confused conceits, some urging her to take the draught, and others bringing a thousand dangerous things to mind. Despite the fantasies that had tormented her during the night, as the dawn began to lift its head above the balustrades of the Orient, Impelled by her fervent love for Romeo that dominated her soul, and having banished her fearful thoughts, in one fierce gulp she drank down the potion, she lay back down, and in but a moment was asleep. Oh, that's magnificent. That's magnificent. Um, Thank you. It, the, translating is very, is, is very difficult, and, and I am a relatively, I'm not firm in anything, but I'm a relatively firm believer that translations are acts of, um, uh, original acts of, of writing. And, and I, I think that's translated beautifully. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And it's really Bandello that's coming through there. He's, um, you know, I'm also working on a translation of, uh, Cinzio's source story for Othello. And yeah, they're different writers. Uh, uh, Cinzio or Cynthio in English, he's really a, a much more kind of matter of fact, grim storyteller. But Bandello, he's using language in beautiful ways. It's this very delicate dance between the macabre and a sort of uh, sensory experience. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the language aspect of it, in that that I translate as well uh, from from early modern Italian, 
Um, methods of approaching original language that are critical. So writers in Renaissance Italy were very creative with what I would consider to be vague standards of written language. I think the Ac uh, Academia della Crusca comes around in the 16th century. Do you? Is, is yeah, I think I'm not sure. I'm not it's, sure. You know, but but before then, you're talking the Vulgate, vernacular languages that end up being integrated into written form. It was Florentine vernacular that Dante used that sort of was a standard that, that authors were using or mixing in types of Latin. Um, can you tell us what variety of Italian that Bandello is writing in and your approach to translating it? Sure. Well, first I should say that I'm not a professional translator. I, I don't have training in translation and I haven't studied literature or theatre at tertiary level. So really I'm a passionate amateur and can really only speak from my experience um, working on, on the text. Bandello's text uh, obviously is not modern Italian, but it's not as remote as Dante or Boccaccio, Dante or Boccaccio. And it's, it's fairly accessible to the modern reader. But, you know, going to your point about, you know, the Florentine being the model of Italian, he, he rather modestly and a little bit unnecessarily, unnecessarily apologizes for the fact that his influence is, uh, sorry, his Italian is influenced by his Lombard dialect. But he makes great efforts to try and conform to Florentine the Florentine standards of uh, speech and writing. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting dimension of how Italian evolves this kind of literary communication between writers. Um, so, you know, that standard Italian was, um, you know, much more a written language than a spoken language, uh, perhaps in this period. I imagine he, he probably spoke Lombard most of his time and perhaps French as well, uh, rather than using this written form. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, but it, it is quite accessible. Uh, there are, of course, you know, archaicisms and, um, other sort of, um, uh, elements of his writing that are a little bit more difficult. For me, you know, his style of writing kind of, and I'm going to use another Tolkien, uh, reference here. Uh, his style kind of evoked the Silmarillion in English for me. And, um, or, or you know, that kind of story or writing. Um, except that Bandello is uh, far more emotive in his storytelling. You know, he, he really tries to convey the feelings of uh, uh, the characters and the, the pathos of the story or the delight uh, that's happening at different points. So the approach I took, I guess the first uh, dimension for me, you know, of course, was to try to capture the meaning, uh, you know, the raw meaning of the author's words. And, you know, for translation, it's a much more intimate experience than, than reading. You know, when you're reading, you, you get caught up in the story and you just move along. With translating, you, you're almost trying to bridge that, you know, that 500 year gap and that linguistic gap between you and the author. So it's quite, um, an intimate, um, uh, process. But yeah, capturing that meaning. And I wanted to be faithful to the text, particularly as the translations that Shakespeare had available weren't as faithful as they might have been. It was hard work, work in some places where Bandello uses obscure words or phrases. And where I got stuck, I, I had a couple of 19th century English translations that I consulted from time to time. The second dimension for me was capturing the emotional depth of the text, which I've already mentioned. And I felt, you know, in those English texts that I was looking at, I wasn't hearing that same emotion that was coming through in the Italian. So I, I tried to, um, you know, convey that through the English text. And of course, you know, Italian is a different language. So you, you have to do it in a way that doesn't end up being melodramatic. So ho hopefully I've, it's, that's come through okay. A third dimension that I wanted to capture was Bandello's style. I've already kind of mentioned he has this beautiful style, which is quite unique, and trying to find phrasing and words so that his voice wasn't lost in, in translation. And finally, the beauty of the language. You know, obviously, beauty in, in, in Italian is slightly different to beauty in English, so trying to find uh, equivalent uh, English phrases that would convey that beauty. 
Um, I should say I also had the help of Maria Scala, who's a professional editor and made many helpful suggestions on uh, the editing the English text of the translation. Um, and others have also helped me on this journey. And I'll just mention Peter Selgan, who did the cover, and Azura Cirincione, who uh, proofread my Italian translation of my English introduction and afterwards. But yeah, that perhaps that gives a little bit of a sense of how it worked, how I worked. Thank you so much. Uh, no, that was that was a fantastic answer. So I just have one last question for you before I let you go here. Once we arrive at Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare, is there any particularly potent moments of complete departure from Bandello? Um, something that that doesn't make it into the story that that we've inherited that mm -hmm. that you think is worth mentioning. Yeah, there's really two. It's interesting to explore these things because you you gain wonderful insights into Shakespeare as well as a as an author and a dramatist. Um, so um, two uh, things to mention is one the ending of the story. So in the Bandello version, Romeo wakes up before. Juliet takes her life. Uh, sorry, Juliet arrives in, you know, yeah, in any case, they're, they're in the tomb together and uh, Juliet wakes up. Sorry, I'm getting confused. Juliet wakes up and before Romeo dies, so they're able to have a conversation. That's lost. Um, I'm not sure if it was the French or, or Brooke who took that out, but they changed it, so there was no final conversation. Another thing that was changed in the Brooke version um, was... There's a long soliloquy by uh, Romeo when he, uh, he when he believes that he's in Mantua and his servant comes to him and tells him the news that Juliet is dead, although we know that she's taken the sleeping potion. So he believes her to be dead. And in Bandello, there's this beautiful soliloquy where we really hear Romeo's sense of guilt in his failure to be able to save um uh, Juliet and, you know, to bring them together. Um, so he's blaming, blaming himself. And we just don't hear that, uh, language in Shakespeare. There's, um, it's focused on him taking the poison. He just goes and buys the poison without, and we don't hear anything about his feelings. And, you know, that's a shame that that bit was lost. So, you know, some things are lost in translation. Um, but, um, you can see also how Shakespeare reworks the material to make it even better again. Uh, for example, at the beginning, um, he tells us that there's these two houses in conflict, and that's very similar to the Bandello novella. But then he adds this op opening scene where he shows us, you know, he has Samson and Gregory and, you know, they're mouthing off about uh, the other side and, you know, they quickly end up in a fight. And um, so, and the prince shows up. So right from the beginning, the stakes, you know, uh, are right there on stage and we, we see it. So that, that's a wonderful sort of example of how uh, Shakespeare can take material and, and, and make it better. We also see sort of examples of how, you know, Shakespeare is inspired to create poetic material. There's, there's um, um, a particular point in the novella where, Romeo and Juliet meet for the first time and Juliet takes Romeo's hand and she says, um, and on her, on her, um, other side is, is the character who's Mercutio. It's called Marcuccio in, in the Bandello version, but, um, uh, Mercutio always has cold hands. So, you know, there's this joke, um, that Juliet uses to tease uh, Romeo, she blesses him because he's come and he's warmed her hand after her other hand has been frozen by Marcuccio or, or Mercutio. So, you know, it's kind of a, a little bit amusing and, uh, you know, we see a little bit of um, Juliet's character. But what this is inspires in Shakespeare is to take that idea of hands meeting and turn it into pilgrim hands do, do meet. I, I don't know if you remember that passage where there's, um, you know, Romeo and Juliet talk to each other in verse. And um, it's as if these these hands are pilgrims on a sacred mission. And, you know, so it's elevating love to this kind of uh, spiritual plane. 
So yeah, just another beautiful example of how Shakespeare improves the plot. The character Mercutio is undeveloped in Bandello, and in Shakespeare, uh, he makes him a much more central character. He's the only character who really develops a lot in the Shakespeare version. He, um, you know, of course, he's kind of involved in provoking some of the conflict that happens, but also he is the catalyst for a curse on the two houses, the Montague and Capulet houses. So, you know, a, cur a cur uh, what does he say? A plague on a both a your plague, houses, I think. A plague on both yeah. your houses, yeah. Yeah, and he repeats that three times, and it's kind of like, you know, right in the heart of the play, and, you know, it's kind of this, you know, sense of foreboding, foreboding as to what's going to come next. So just magic, um, uh, you know, in how this dramatist is, is taking it and elevating it. I think also another interesting kind of thing to bring out with the differences between the stories is some of the social and cultural differences between the English context and the Italian context. So, you know, one example is Juliet's age. So in Shakespeare, Juliet is not yet 14. And they keep saying that, you know, they say it at various points in the play. And it seems to be quite, quite a thing that Juliet's not yet 14. But in the Italian story, she's almost 18. And, you know, in fact, her parents in the end don't even want her, you know, they're, they're having second thoughts about marrying her to, to Paris. And if they could, they wouldn't have married her, wouldn't have continued because they still think she's a little bit too young. So there's this interesting change. And, you know, I, I haven't really found an evidence of why this change occurred. The French started to reduce the age, the French translation translators, or Brook, they brought it down to 16. Uh, but in any case, you know, this age thing was something that seemed significant to the English uh, audience and the English writer. Perhaps they were thinking something about, you know, some presumption about Italian marriage practices, or maybe it was something going on in England. But in any case, it was different uh, in the English, in the Italian context. Maybe it was the fact that they needed to use a young actor, a young male actor on stage to represent Juliet. In Italy... You've just given someone a PhD thesis. Someone's going to tune into this again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. Yeah, the, the, there would be a lot of fun in exploring that. And the other interesting element of this is that in Italy at the time, there were already professional actresses on stage in Italy um, performing. So, yeah, I interesting differences there. In um, another kind of difference relates to how family is represented in the two plays. In the Shakespeare version, I think he's much more concerned with the kind of, um, you know, thinking and action of, say, aristocratic families, you know, who, whose primary concern is to marriage alliances and that sort of stuff. In Bandello's version, we get a much more human Capulet and Lady Capulet. They're, um, you know, they're really concerned about the welfare of her daughter, of their daughter. And in fact, the reason, you know, and this plot element is kind of broken in the Shakespeare play because of, you know, the improvements on the dramatic side, but this particular element was broken. And that is that the reason the family want to marry Juliet to Paris is because she's depressed. And she's depressed because Romeo has been exiled. And, you know, so there's really deep depression. And also Romeo, he suffers. And, you know, as all these things uh, uh, are happening, you, you see Lady Capulet's emotion and her suffering when she believes Juliet has died, for example. And um, Romeo also is suffering, you know, serious mental health issues. It starts with that. The whole story starts with his obsession with the character we know as Rosaline and his friends really concerned about um, his mental state and trying to help him overcome it. But the, the tragedy of the story is really the failure of the society to help these two young people as they're struggling with, um, their love for each other and their mental health. So, you know, another kind of interesting sort of, uh, difference between the two stories. So, you know, there are many kind of reasons you might want to explore the, uh, Bandello version. You know, to, to experience this, this kind of more authentically Italian version, for example, to, to explore the relationship between the texts. But it, it's a great read in its own right. And if you're going to a Verona, uh, that's the version to read because you'll, you'll get a much more concrete sense of place and feeling about Verona from reading Bandello as opposed to reading the play.
Michael, is there anything on your mind that you think listeners need to leave this podcast knowing about Matteo Bandello, about your translation, about anything we talked about today? Oh, thanks, Lawrence. It's a wonderful pleasure to be able to talk about it. Hopefully, we've explored quite a, a few dimensions. There's, there's, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot more that we haven't touched on, uh, but perhaps it'd be useful just to talk about uh, how people can obtain a copy of the of the translation if they'd like to. Absolutely, everyone listening in the show notes, I am going to link Michael's author page author website right is that it's it's I, yep yep um it's more it's a, a whole site um with with all of his written work and a link where you can purchase a copy of his just out in 2023 right um that's right yeah late 2020 yeah just just fresh off the press michael cortati's romeo and juliet translated into english by matteo bandello um that will be available via link in the show notes just give that a click Get your hands on it. So, yeah, if people are looking for it, the best place to go is Amazon. And uh, it, just to mention, it's it's available in two versions. So there's a parallel Italian-English version, and the, there's also an English-only version. And um, if you search for Michael Cattotti, and that's spelt with uh, C-U-R-T-O-T-T-I, uh, on Amazon, you'll find it. Uh, but also, yeah, um uh, consult the show notes and uh, uh, Lawrence I want to thank you again it's been such a wonderful conversation a lot lots of fun to be sharing with you about this perhaps just to mention um, these uh, writers of this period they they really are significant to our world today and um, we learn so much by going back to what they were thinking uh, what they were the issues they were struggling with or or their societies were struggling with some of it is we're, there's still issues we're, we're talking about today. I want to thank everyone so much for tuning in again. Until next time, arrivederci.